Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Brad, how are you doing today? Today's a good day. How about you? I'm good, thanks. we got an excellent uh, guest on the show today, Dr. John Madigan from the University of California, Davis. Yeah, and he's a, an incredibly interesting guy. He's a lot of fun. He's funny. Uh, and I, I've enjoyed kind of growing up in veterinary medicine with Madigan as one of those guys that's kind of idolized. Uh, great neonatologist, medicine guy, and we've got him on for a very special reason today. Yeah, he's had a storied career. He's done some amazing stuff, um, and he is uh, pushed into areas that um, a lot of people didn't, and he's actually come up with some foundational stuff that really changes what we do. Uh, today, he's going to talk about the squeeze technique. Um, a lot of people talk about the Madigan squeeze, and that's a really interesting way of trying to manage some of these maladjusted foals. The foal that comes out, and it just doesn't quite hit its goalposts. It's just a little bit slow. It sleeps a bit, lies around the place, and doesn't get up and get on that mare and get out of it. And I'm looking forward to his insights on that and um, what he thinks um, this technique does and um, any predictions for the future. Yep, and, I, and I've been one of the skeptics, I have to admit, but I have seen it work, and so it'll be interesting to have him here today to explain that because it, it, I'm, I've become a believer. Yeah, I know. I mean, when I first heard about it, I sort of thought, I'm not sort of sure how this goes on, but there's no d- doubting that if you pick the right case that this technique makes a difference that you can't make in any other way. I mean, some yeah. of these foals, there's no amount of medication that's going to fix it. You squeeze them, and all of a sudden, this foal is right back where you would want it to be. Yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, yeah. well, without further ado. Yeah, so on the show today, we have Dr. John Madigan from the University of California, Davis, talking about the Madigan squeeze. John, welcome to Stallside. Hey, how are you guys doing out there? We're, we're probably not as good as you. It's a little colder and wetter here, but uh, th- that, that California weather, I'm sure, is good. But we'll, we'll live by proxy. Very good. Yeah. <clears throat> so, John, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm a uh, uh, emeritus uh, distinguished professor from uh, UC Davis, and uh, I still have some ongoing research in, uh, uh, in a couple of different areas. And... Uh, i am uh, got a little more time to uh, turn the irrigation on for the horses and things like that with the emeriti status, but <laughs> we have uh, about half a dozen projects still running and uh, with grad students and other faculty uh, in a variety of areas, uh, neurology and, and, uh, and a focus on the neonate uh, as well. Yeah, it's always impressed me um, the uh, the breadth and also the depth of uh, impact you've actually had on veterinary medicine. But you've touched on the subject that we're here to talk today, and that's actually sort of novel ways to manage the maladjusted foal. And so uh, you've come up with a very interesting technique. Uh, we'd like to hear the background about what you what got you to where you are, you know, in neonatal medicine and um, the techniques that you come up with. So the floor is yours. All right. Well, if it's all right, I'll see if I can. Uh, push the right button for the uh, screen share, and you you tell me how I'm doing that way. Is that all right? Yep, yep, that'd be perfect. Very good. Well, today we'll talk about maladjustment syndrome. There's a variety of names for that, of course, in this and what's uh, the squeeze therapy, and then looking at the neurochemistry of the dummy foal. And I think uh, we we thought that would be a a, a good topic for your uh, podcast, which I think are excellent ideas. And uh, this is, I'm being assisted with that, with the research and everything with uh, Dr. Alleman, uh, a a neurologist and uh, internist here at UC Davis. And if you have time, uh, some of the insight that we've learned from the foal does seem to have uh, uh, some possible connections to uh, uh, some uh, uh, human health things and kangaroo mother care. So if we have time. But, uh, you know, when you say, well, how do you get into uh, neonatology? I I got hired at UC Davis because of my infectious disease uh, activities in Mendocino County, where I was uh, fortunate enough to discover a pretty rare infectious disease there, Leaky Equi, in Mendocino County. There were only six cases in the world. And then that led to uh, identifying uh, human infection with that age and NIH grant. So uh, I was uh, happily doing that and trying to learn a little more internal medicine. Then one of our faculty died in a plane crash, and he was a neonatal guy. So 
uh, I got a new assignment. The uh, department chair just handed me a binder of slides with all those neonates. And there were, at that time, there was a real uh, interesting phenomenon going on. There were only two NICUs in the United States, and Tim Cudd there in, uh, in uh, Kentucky had one and one in Florida. So it was very uh, 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 helpful, actually, to uh, start with the idea that I really didn't know very much and I needed to get input. So I went to as many meetings as I could. And then we created a team uh, like they did at Florida and also Tim Cudd did with uh, where you get together with a human neonatologist. So Boyd Getzman, who was chief of neonatology at Med Center, would go to all our rounds and help us as we developed, uh, you know, processes. So this was really, I was happened to be there in the mid eighties with the emergence of neonatal critical care for foals and uh, all the things that we take for granted. Now we actually didn't have back then. So we had to create a unit, get different people. There's Gary Magdesian and uh, facilities that are required. And of course, the other part, besides uh, you know being uh, asked to do the neonatal uh, work there at Davis, uh, developing the NICU and whatnot, we're very uh, heavily oriented towards uh, research. And of course, the symbol there, let there be light, is part of that thing. So, taking a look at things, uh, sometimes uh, things we've been looking at for a long time, and then seeing what uh, done. So we have a pretty uh, big group there, an equine comparative re uh, neurology research group. Yeah, it's international. Uh, Dr. Haggett was in our group. She's uh, now uh, goes by her married name, Floyd, at uh, Rosdale, Elizabeth Woolsey in Australia, Blas Toth, Hungary, Pat McHugh, Colorado, and then David Meller in uh, New Zealand. So the focus here, uh, there's a lot of different names for this, the dummy foal, of course, uh, uh, perinatal asphyxia syndrome, neonatal encephalopathy, and then hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and that was the one that uh, a lot of uh, uh, internists had uh, uh, that were seeing these foals were uh, saying that that's the explanation for the behavior is uh, the latter, the HIE. And of course, it's a clinical diagnosis. And it's associated with events that could be presumed to have a hypoxic uh, component. You see the, uh, you know, premature placental separation there, and you have to get that full out in a short period of time. And a significant number of those do <clears throat> go on to develop maladjustment syndrome. But the uh, there's something else that's going on there, too. They're only in the birth canal for about four minutes if you're uh, getting them out in a timely fashion. So a lot of the stuff was circumstantial. And some of the old path that was done uh, in uh, in England and other places, those foals died without intensive care, and they had septicemia and DIC and probably a lot of cytokine cascades. And we don't see that neuropath in the maladjusted foals that we have to quit on unless they're uh, uh, truly asphyxiated. So at, at your place, Bill Bernard uh, wrote some things up and other institution ours. If you've got the time and the money and uh, you've got about 80% of these recover, and uh, uh, that's the good news, it does take effort. It does take time. It's three to five days. A lot of times it can certainly be quicker. But as I step back and look at this, uh, there wasn't much uh, evidence for this uh, ischemic injury, hypoxic ischemic injury. And the, the fact that there, the epidemiology actually didn't support this. So since I had the connection with the neonatologist and I would go on rounds there, they'd ask me to give a talk about this particular topic. And then they said, uh, always they would say, well, what do you do with those foals that recover but have significant residual neurologic deficits? And I said, we really don't have any in that 80%. And then they would ask, do you think something else is going on besides oxygen-related uh, and ischemic injury? So, you know, it, with severe hypoxia, there's cell death. And then these are the uh, unfortunate long-term uh, effects of birth asphyxia and, uh, and motor activity, behavioral a whole host of things. So we, we don't see a lot of these. So this is one that, uh, you know, this uh, explanation and uh, epidemiology for this being severe hypoxemia, and uh, it, it, it just bothered me, and we didn't see these uh, long-term uh, 
uh, facts that are seen in uh, uh, birth asphyxia, and in, uh, including motor problems and whatnot. So, uh, and then a lot of these cases, uh, this is one from uh, quite a few years ago that we didn't treat, but it was treated there, I believe, in uh, at, uh, Kentucky, probably your place. And he goes on and wins the Kentucky Derby and, and whatnot. And so it, it was kind of hard to believe that for me that uh, HIE was the, the whole thing. It didn't make sense, uh, this lack of deficit. So we looked at this from the, um, I like this quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light evolution. So we tried to look and say, well, this is a prey animal and we have 11 months and in the equine fetus progestins, in addition to promoting neuronal and glial differentiation and plasticity, it induces a sleep-like state. And then you have to transition immediately after birth because you're a prey animal. You're not going to be picked up and held and whatnot. So this is a, a pretty rapid uh, and, and I'd say a amazing transition in consciousness at birth and uh, that's um, giving it away that we believe that actually maladjustment is a failure to completely transition consciousness at birth. So it stands in one to two hours, nursing two to three. So I was fortunate enough when I got uh, into the uh, neonatal assignment that uh, looked around and so the first perinatology society meeting was in 1988 and I got to uh, meet Peter Rosdale and hobnob with him and then really take a look at some of his earlier work and he they called it the convulsive syndrome because some of these folks do have seizures so he and uh, Mahaffey and this is in the 50s so uh, you're getting the very latest here at your podcast you know, <laughs> the, the literature but it says it's if you re get a chance to read these the convulsive syndrome appears seen only in foals born indoors under human supervision and in contrast, you don't see in Australia on thoroughbred mares giving birth unattended out in the paddocks and in England. So he says, uh, there's something going on with uh, this managed birth thing. And of course, he created these uh, uh, group one, group two conditions. And he said, I like the name maladjustment syndrome uh, and the causes are complex and not fully understood, but possibly hypoxia and circulatory disturbances and, uh, and he said here, particularly rapid and easy births often precede signs of maladjustment. So taking that in, I also looked at some of his work and he got uh, together with uh, the group up in Oregon that has a mass spec and everything. And here he is, you know, in England and in the early 90s doing this really fundamental research. And one of the things, of course, is that how does the full uh, stay asleep and not gallop in the womb you know it's not a good idea to gallop in utero so uh and you don't want to wake up when somebody's doing a rectal exam when you a loud noise happens or what have you so the foals asleep with these progesterone derived sedative uh neurosteroids allopregnenolone is a big one and they actually synthesize it within uh, their own uh, fetus via the the good uh, uh large gonads. So what Peter did is he, he measured everything. And so here's some graphs back from the early uh, 90s and late 80s. And these are a plasma progestins measured by radio amino acid. And there, we found, of course, they're measuring six or eight different compounds. And they start to go down in the folds that are normal. And they, 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 they're high right after they come out of the womb because they're involved with keeping the full sleep. And then two hours, four hours, they go down. But in these abnormal folds, they go down and then they start kicking up. And uh, that's a very important finding. And they looked and a lot of them didn't have names yet and they didn't know exactly what the neurochemistry was. But one of those on there that this, I won't try to do the five alpha pregnant, uh, you know, 20 alpha, that's uh, actually uh, 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 allopregnenolone. So the big event for me, you know, moseying around, treating the foals with intensive care and doing everything we normally do and having the outcomes. We're also running into foals that we run out of money on. I don't know whether that ever happens to you guys there, but, you know, you're just waiting for them to kick, you know, in and start. And uh, so it was always a, a challenge. So I went on sabbatic with uh, my two kids in New Zealand and I walked into a lecture that David Miller was giving and he had a run a welfare program and it was about pain and pain perception and consciousness so they could export uh, 
uh, meat, uh, sheep, you know, and lambs and, and, uh, and, and such. So I heard about progesterone derivative anesthetic neurosteroids for the first time. And I remembered the graph that Peter Rosdale gave when he gave the Milne lecture. And here's total progestins. Again, they weren't run by mass spec, but here's less than one hour. You see the level right here. And it goes down and when everything's good and these these solid bars and then these are two maladjusted abnormal folds starts to go down something says we better uh make some more of this stuff and so uh that was just an observation that was in the early 90s so i wanted to find a way to measure neurosteroids that was more specific than what peter was doing and we got to hold the liquid uh, chromatography mass spec it's expensive I've been lucky to get a lot of private donors that uh, don't mind crazy ideas to start with and take a look. And then we also had the ability to do some uh, brainwave things with Dr. Allman being a board certified uh, neurologist as well as internal medicine. So well, why folds don't gallop in utero became our uh, focus and uh, we took a look at it. So one of the first folds that uh, came in was pretty bad to Scotia. We did brainwave on. Uh, we nicknamed him Bernie, and uh, when we looked at some of the levels of some of these neurosteroids, uh, like if you look at pregnant diol, they're 12,000 times higher than an age-matched foal, 200 times higher for many of them, 10 times higher. So you don't need a statistician, statistician to help you with this uh, p-value on these. So we have association there. So we expanded this and did the study with uh, in Rosdale's group and looked at abnormal neuroactive progestins in ill, septic, and foals that uh, had uh, maladjustment without a positive sepsis score, realized sepsis score isn't, isn't perfect. But these plasma samples that we took them at, and did the, uh, the mass spec and uh, took a look at them, and these are the progestins that we took a look at. The good news, there won't be a test about this. It's just showing how you can separate these uh, molecules with that particular methodology. So uh, what we found in normal foals, the levels are at a certain level, and then they drop. You can see by 24 or 48 hours, DHEA, then pregnenolone, it's really, really high. And then it goes down to 24 hours, and that's it, it, as the foal assumes this normal consciousness. So you see these things, when everything goes right, they go way down. And then in 19 mild, moderate, and 13 severe, uh, from mildly obtunded to stuporous, a uh, significant increase in several of these neurosteroids that have CNS effects. And you can see the p-values are uh, pretty impressive. So, uh, you know, there wasn't a big difference in the steroid levels in moderate to severely affected maladjusted foals. And then here's the uh, some more concentration. So here's a take home point too, because this is real interesting for the maladjusted foals. In the foals that were septicemic by blood culture or uh, uh, sepsis score, they had a very high levels of the, some of these neurosteroids. And uh, when they started getting better, these P4 and P5, if we can abbreviate some of these progestins, started going down. So when we're in critical care with septic foals, we're dealing with abnormal pathophysiology of neurosteroid levels. And one of the things we need to do in critical care is something's too high, we try to lower it. If something's too low, we raise it. I don't want to be overly simple, but we can't ignore these elevations that have significant brain effects and other physiological functions. So this is a graph showing the normal ones goes down like this and, and get there. So what do these do? They modulate the GABA receptor and opioid uh, glutamate and opioid neurotransmission. I actually had a couple of foals that responded naloxone and that was a low dose naloxone. They probably had low level of neurosteroid and they, they, they got quite a, a striking change. I'm not recommending that because you'd have to use a bucket full of it. But uh, these, they, 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 uh, they, they affect the brain development and functioning, and uh, they're really important, but they also uh, make you sleepy. And uh, that's why the foals uh, don't uh, jump around in utero. So they, they're made from cholesterol via progesterone by 5-alpha reductase, 
and they can be made in the brain independent of, of, the, of the, that circulating in the blood. They do cross the blood-brain barrier, but the, the brain can change the receptors for the GABA receptor, which is a giant chloride channel, immediately it can close it. So if you're going in to get an anesthetized, you don't have to sit there for an hour while they're inducing you. You get that rapid change in that uh, that uh, uh, receptor, the GABA receptors, and you go and lose consciousness. So it can happen pretty fast. So what we discovered is the neonatal foal with the condition known as maladjustment is associated with persistence of hormones secreted in utero to keep the foal in a sleep-like state. And I was there in New Zealand. I saw this one foal in the, their small NICU they had. All he did was one to curl up like that. So you started thinking, well, you know, is he think it's a foal, you know, physiologically, certainly you CNS-wise is not normal. But if you look, well, what do they need to be in utero? Well, the depressed, uh, if you want to call it that, or not moving. Respiratory, you don't need ventilation. A lot of our maladjusted folds, we have to use uh, uh, respiratory stimulants and other things. GI, minimum motility, you feed them, it sits in the, you know, just sits there in the stomach. Renal function isn't, isn't terrific. Thermal regulation, you don't need to do that in utero, and we have trouble with that uh, outside. And of course, ambulation. So it's not the craziest idea that uh, these things are affecting the physiology besides the neurochemistry. And as if we have time later, it's very important in neurodevelopment as well as alteration in consciousness, all starting from cholesterol. So getting back to some real life full stuff, see, we had the observation. So we took one of the compounds that's been measured by Rosdale and others and it's a tricky thing to measure allopregnenolone. I won't get into this stuff. But we went ahead and infused a uh, foal. Is that showing up on the screen, uh, Peter? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So this is just a healthy neonatal foal. And you see Dr. Haggett, uh, in, uh, also uh, known as Dr. Floyd now. So we just infused him. And I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit if that works okay. And so here's this is a healthy research foal. And uh, we've given them uh, the, the best guess of uh, allopregnenolone dose. And we're seeing we're affecting uh, the, the, uh, the ability to stand. And then uh, we're watching his ventilation uh, by putting a piece of straw in front of his nose because we don't want to, you know, uh, put a whole bunch of things on him. We later recorded this. And he goes into a sleep-like state. And... Uh, and then uh, with the dose that we gave, and then uh, if you try to, you know, uh, stimulate him and get him to wake up, he actually won't wake up, but he does actually do some uh, movement and arousal things. And, of course, uh, I couldn't help but see if you folded him up and he had nice limp limbs, uh, that would not poke a hole in the uterus. So I thought, man, somebody, that, that allopregnilo in evolutionary biology or the, uh, the great creator did a, a pretty good job of figuring out how to keep a 100 pound foal asleep in utero uh, so here's another one i'll turn the sound down if i can here's another one and we're doing brain waving they actually go into a form of slow wave sleep so we gave a less of a dose so this guy is uh, certainly phenotypically looks a bit like a dummy and he wasn't until we uh, infused that and you can see my, I say, the people say, do you do neurology? I hold the wires and keep them from falling out. <laughs> that's my main job. I try to cut myself off and don't tell people that that's just me holding wires, but that's that's it. And then we go back to the clinic and we're looking at a maladjusted foal in one of our foal boxes. And, you know, the phenotypically look a little bit similar. So it kind of bothers me that this foal actually died in uh ended up with renal failure was one of the antioxidant drugs uh, that we were uh, trying and uh, uh, but this guy is actually full of uh, compounds that are making him asleep and in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, on post-mortem he did not have uh, brain lesions compatible with HIE at all and I used to like to take him outside I'm sure you do that get a little sunlight on and we try to wake him up and then three to five days they go home and then Caribio and others uh, gave this talk at the ACBIM. He had a Grayson Foundation grant uh, in within six months of that to take a look at these uh, same compounds. And it was nice to see that he saw those in the maladjusted fold, but also in the septic fold. 
So in the maladjusted folds failed to transition consciousness at birth, that's what we think, and resulting abnormal behavior, bond with the mother, and failure to locate the udder for nursing, disorientation is uh, what we see associated with that. So you asked me to talk about the squeeze. That's a long introduction, isn't it? But I hope that it uh, helps that you guys, uh, that, that that's background information kind of will help with this. So I'm doing research. We have pretty people looking for projects. We wanted to see what is the cause of the flopping reaction, independent of anything to do with maladjustment. Okay, so this is uh, Blas Toth. He needs a project for his master's. Uh, Dr. Allman is always interested. Joe Mayhew said this is narcolepsy, cataplexy, and we all know, you know, holding onto a fold, their head drops, they you let go, they knock your glasses off and hop around and all that stuff. So this has been described since the early 20s, and anybody who works on folds knows this. So we started out to say, let's create the flopping reaction and then take a look at all these different things as well as brainwave. And then Dr. Allman says, you know, to get those electrodes in and get a nice recording, I need 20 minutes. Okay. Well, we couldn't figure out how to hold the fold down. And I remember in private practice, I used this a couple of times in because uh, we did have some uh, uh, food animal work and whatnot. I remembered th- this thing. So we put it on the fold. I'd never used it on a fold before. It was strictly for this experiment. So we put on the fold and uh, is a modified rope squeeze. So here you see how we did. We go between the front legs and tie a bowline, which can be a challenge for some people. You don't, you can actually get one with a lariat like Hondo. So that goes across the front of the chest. And if you can tie a bowline, that's great. And the bowline just is a knot that won't overly tighten there. And of course, the contraindication for this would be fractured ribs, uh, but I don't think you need to do this in folds with fractured ribs because they've had a pretty tight squeeze going through the burst canal, and that's why they broke their ribs in the first place. So we put a half hitch there over the thorax, adjust a little bit. And this is one of our research folds. This is somebody filming, doing it for the first time to see, can we actually use this to do the research study? So there's another half hitch, and it could go around the flank. I, we try to stay away from the umbilicus, but goes around the chest. Okay, so there's that, and that's called a half hitch uh, that we go. And so that's Balaz Toth hoping that his entire uh, master's project goes well as we're putting this the dang thing on this Because <laughs> he's got his whole graduate work is dependent on getting some uh, study. So this guy got pulled, just laid down, you know, so nice. It looked like a rock academy, you know, anesthesia. And, uh, and people say, well, how much tension do you have on there? It's like a you're taking a big dog, that, the dog that's not that well-mannered on the leash there, put a little bit of tension, and you just keep enough tension so they stay asleep. And so you can see Toth is very nervous there. I, I get a real kick out of watching it going, oh, Jesus, I hope they held this in. <laughs> so we take it off, and it's very interesting how fast uh, we did 20 minutes, and then, you know, it looked like it wasn't hurting him. And then we did our study. So they, they immediately pop up, and this guy goes over and nurses. So that's what we did. We ended up doing a study. It produced predictable somnolence. They went into non-REM sleep. Their heart rate and respiratory rate and body temperature went down. Endorphins went up, and it activated the uh, hypothalamic adrenal access, which is part Actually, the birth process with ACTH and whatnot. So we, we, we wanted to get this published. So while we were doing the neonatal you know, maladjustment, chemistry said, let's measure this before and after the dang uh, flopping reaction thing. So we got some science in there in case somebody says, oh, great. You put a rope on a fold and you went to sleep. There's not too much to talk about there. So we measured all these things. And at the end of 20 minutes... Two of these hormones, DHEA sulfate and androstrene dione, went up, as well as uh, uh, ACTH. And this is where we did the brain wave, and we also did pain recordings and uh, p- a profound change alertness. And then uh, Dr. Allman picked these up, and uh, she's uh, kindly, it's like when I was in uh, radiology in class. I could always see the lesion if they put a circle around it. It really seemed like <laughs> that is helpful. what we have here. Because let me tell you, I'm not 
Anyway, these are vertex sharp waves. These are alpha beta waves and K complex and whatnot. And these are forms of uh, uh, REM sleep. ACTH significantly went up. Uh, uh, temperature went down. Heart rate went down. So this is what happens when they go through the birth canal. And we weren't thinking that at the time. So I'm kind of jumping ahead. But you see that. You see. So, so that's what happened. And we said, hey, you could maybe use this for minor procedures, ultrasound, x-ray, nasogastric tube, catheter replacement, you know, those kind of things. But, you know, when you're driving home after work and you go, why did those two hormones go up? And I got my master's uh, in looking at insulin uh, uh, half-life in horses, and I was really into that feedback, you know, something goes up, then that turns that off. And so I had that glued in my head, and that's actually not what's complete going on but i thought is the is the way this works is you have these hormones keeping you asleep in the womb for 11 months then miraculously you get into position and you get your nose and two feet there and you sure as hell don't want a lot of wiggling and retraction so you use the tonic immobility of the thoracic squeezing of the fold going through the birth canal okay that makes perfect sense but they're a prey animal, so why not dial down the anesthesia while you're going through the birth canal so when you pop out, the wolf and everything doesn't have as big a chance. And this is so similar to the anesthesiologist. I hear them in there all the time talking to the surgeon. Almost done yet? Almost done yet? They want to crank it down so that horse doesn't break a leg in anesthesia. Well, this if that was it, it would be a pretty cool system. So opportunity knocks sometimes via the cell phone and i got a phone call from ellen jackson a, a very experienced thoroughbred breeder and she knew i was doing research and she had an eight hour old full wandering upside down the feeder not nursing and she said hey i'm not spending a nickel on this thing i'm really out of money right at the time i'm just not going to do it and i'm real busy and if you got anything i can just give this full to wake it up have you ever had a client ask you something like <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a California <laughs> phenomenon, but we no, no, no. It's universal. Yeah, yeah, everywhere. Immediate cures that are in a small syringe or a pill. So I asked her, "What about the birth?" She says it was normal. So we know we have to quiz our clients. I said, "How long did it take?" It was quick. The full alert went off. I came out of the kitchen. There he was. And then I said. Oh, a quick birth, Peter Rosdale. Oh, my God. Maybe you didn't get the feedback loop and everything. I'm not on duty. And I say, you want to try something new? She said, yes. I said, if you got a rope, I'll meet you there. So away I went in my Prius. It's the only time I went on a neonatal call with no drugs, no equipment, and not in a vet truck. So here's the guy sitting there laying down when I arrived, and he screwed up. He's trying to stand up. He's been upside down in the feeder. And uh, so I wanted to verify, you know, what was going on. And uh, they, they, you know, had a pretty clean uh, area there, relatively speaking. So I put the, that's a hell of a rope there. But did you see that nickering? Did you guys mm -hmm. catch that? Yep, we caught it. Yep. Set up, so. Just like it's been born, that's the most fabulous thing when he's been dissociated for eight hours. So I'm making these uh, incredible predictions based on it, not even the end of one. So it should take him, you know, Wobbly is. It should take him an hour to find. So I'm presuming that this is actually like the birth, you know, it's a pretty, uh, kind of a big assumption, but it was based on our data. Uh, and you can see the confidence that the owner has in this. She's milking it out so I can tube feed it while I was there because she said we're trying to wake the foal up, not put it to sleep. So the procedure seemed a little counterintuitive. But then he went over there and and then, of course, we're really looking for aspiration, the, the effect and miss of the tongue curl. And this guy, he's got it all together really fast i mean i wasn't there an hour so it was shocking uh you know happily uh then uh was towards the end of the polling season so bull Wilsey had this 48 hour old so we have this thing about eight that's why i'm showing this guy in here 
And he's wandering around. The people just got tired of tube feeding him and, and doing things. I can't tell you the events of parturition other than he was on antibiotics, so he wasn't septic. But he doesn't care about the mother, and the mother doesn't care about him, and he's just wandering around. So I showed Dr. Woolsey how to do this over the Internet, and she uh, had her technician uh, put the, uh, uh, the rope squeeze on. And I'm going to jump through this in the interest of time. And uh, and so, you know, it looks like he was asleep. He's doing the big stretch and doing everything. But this guy had not followed the mirror at all. He'd walked underneath and done all this stuff. So here's this slow motion turn. And he could say, well, that's just a random event that he's now walking over towards the mother. But actually didn't turn out to be that. It actually turned out that all of a sudden, after the 20 minutes of squeezing, and uh, you can see he's a little kind of, you know, still staggery and whatnot because he's got these, uh, what we presume are the GABA effects. And the mayor is now like, what the hell is this? You haven't been around. I, I often pretend I know what the mayor is thinking, and I, it's a, 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 a trait that you develop over uh, 30, 40 years. So there he is trying to do this, and then all of a sudden he's under there. And then five minutes later, he's nursing. So he's only been at the clinic there for a few hours, and uh, they were planning on doing their normal supportive stuff. Then here he is seven hours later, he's nursing without any assistance, and he's turning into a little hellion, you know, wise guy. But look at the coordination that he has. It's, it's quite good. So he's done, you know, gone through a pretty good maturational thing. So that's fold number two that was a maladjusted fold. It had to be 48 hours, and then he had no further care, and he's romping around without, you know, residual neurologic deficits. So this is what we think is going on in utero. You have the sedative neurosteroids. You also have adenosine, prostaglandins, placental peptide, neuroinhibitors, and all that stuff. And it inhibits consciousness, gut motility, subreflex movement. You go to stage later, get this squeezing, neuroinhibition, then afterwards onset of breathing, touch, and, and all that. So you want to throw any questions at or I'll talk about the survey then we said well let's put this out a little bit bigger than you know two folds that uh, that we just did it on you, Dr. Madigan you alluded to using that for some simple procedures mm -hmm. do, do, are, do people use that for uh, in um, in lieu of using sedatives yeah it folds less than seven days of age it's uh, used for plasma administration uh, umbilical ultrasound eye exams, uh, heart auscultations, and you don't have to use uh, sedation to get them into recumbency. And in fact, at this one thoroughbred farm, they're now up to over 400 foals that have been, this has been used on for plasma transfusion by one person. The person comes in, it's 18 to 24 hours, sometimes 12 hours. They got the plasma thawed, it's on a stand. They put the uh, squeeze system on, get the, and they use a harness, and uh, and it, and, it, and it so it locks into place. The foal lays down, goes to sleep. They let the mare walk up there. The baby's asleep. The mares don't mind the foal going to sleep, and they put their uh, let them. Uh, they just leave them loose there. So the mother's head's right at the foal's head. She puts in a little block, puts a catheter in, runs the stuff, has a blanket over the foal's uh, head, has the squeeze on runs the plasma very rapidly, takes it off, takes the, the uh, catheter out, takes the thing off, and she's uh, done over 400 now. Yeah, because uh, I hate sedating those really young foals, and every now and then we have to. The one application that I'm thinking of that might be very helpful is when we have to splint yeah, bandages, some of those, yeah. you know, put those splints on, because you got to knock them down, and, it, yeah. and they resist even with sedation. It hurts, and... Yeah, I'm going to give it a whirl. Yeah, I get a, quick, yeah. a few quick bandages yeah, in the clinic. You know, one other you... tip is that if it's a little bit older foal, you can use a real tiny bit of uh, alpha-2, not enough to do anything, because that actually kind of is a contributor towards that sleep-like state, you know, and that's why we get kicked when these horses are standing with their head down there, half asleep, you touch them, and they don't know you're there. So uh, I have some clients doing that, and then after seven days of age where you still have some splint problems, some other things sometimes, 
they'll use a very low dose and the squeeze, and they say it, it, it potentiates the uh, ability to do it. So I just share that. Mm -hmm. That's been okay. used uh, in a lot of clinical situations. But you said the neuro testing the neuro for the neurosteroids is cost prohibitive. Anything on the horizon where we might be able to um, use this for a diagnosis, or is it still just going to be a clinical yeah. diagnosis? No, I'm going to show you a, a example uh, of a, a test that you can actually uh, use. Okay. Uh, and that can be run in house uh, or uh, fairly rapidly. So I, I'll give it away in a second. Okay. Uh, when we go through it, but I think uh, it's a great marker. And when I, when I get called and I've got a folded, they, they say, "Hey, it's out seven days, and they haven't done the squeeze, and the fold's really." messed up and whatnot, I'll ask them to measure uh, that compound. And if it's not elevated, then the, the, you don't try to go through a series of squeeze procedures or anything. So, all right. So I get to screen share again. Yep. Sure. Unless Peter, do you have any other questions? No, I mean, I, I, like I was saying before, I found the, the, the rope technique good for just like bandage. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to like just put a bandage on to straighten out a fetlock. Yep. You know, it's just great. You don't have to knock it down, give it the rope, do the bandage, let the rope go, pop straight up, and gets back on the mare again. You know, so yep. anytime you keep the foal off the ground is good. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Very good. So uh, we took a look and we tried to do as randomized a thing as possible out in the field. And so uh, we had a, a 195 foals that were in this uh, study and uh, the 108 of them got medical treatment. And then 87 got squeeze and or combination treatment, but the squeeze was added. And the response to treatment at different time points, and again, it's a clinical diagnosis. So within one hour, uh, four foals uh, uh, went on to, and we used the criteria of attaching to the udder and successfully nursing and swallowing. That's an observational thing that we thought was pretty reliable. And, it, and in, when the medical treated foals, four uh, uh, of that group, uh, in that 108 group, uh, were uh, nursing within an hour, and 32 of those that received the squeeze were nursing within an hour. And then as you see, to go out nursing within less than 24 hours, you have 34 with a medical, so they started coming around uh, 27 in the other group. So when we look at this, the faster recovery scale, the odds ratio, which a lot of people like to use, and the p-values are there, and uh, the, the, it's the foals uh, got 15.1 uh, uh, odds ratio, uh, more likely to be nursing within an hour if you incorporate the squeeze. So we thought that was pretty good. So what what, what what's going on? Why is the squeeze uh, 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 accelerating? The, uh, the finding of the utter and normalcy of, uh, of uh, the, that brain activity. So we're saying in utero, you go through the, you're, you're asleep, uh, and then the placenta is making estradiol, you have stage two labor, you get a surge of estradiol, you get an effect on the locus ceruleus, which caused epinephrine, norepinephrine, sorry, and arousal. So we think this is the same thing that's going on here uh, that when we do the the uh, flopping reaction experimental squeeze thing, which we know has all these other you know metabolic effects, it's also creating this uh, activation, just like the uh, birth canal. Uh, we think is doing that. So yeah, it's it's being used all over the place. So this is some yesterday. Uh, on this uh, bet to bet, she said first dummy fold of the year, and the Madigan squeeze works again. Was normal with an hour. She actually put a tube in and was going to tube feed it and then said, hey, I'll give it a try. So that's nice to see. So here's some tips on doing this. This is for the maladjusted fold, not for the sedation procedures, is you may need to repeat it. You can do it two, six hours. Uh, if you get an initial response, years go up, they look more alert, then they start fading over several hours. We do it again. We think there's endogenous release and, uh, and the receptor in the brain needs another hit. We suggest letting the foal sleep even after 20 minutes. You remove the rope. If they want to sleep, let them sleep. And then assist larger foals to lay down. I, you, you see some of these big foals that are looking down at the ground, and they almost uh, appear to be afraid to, to, you know, flop down and everything. And we think the inability to sleep shortly after they first stand and nurse 
is a contributing factor to the reversion of fetal consciousness uh, is that the sleep needs to uh, keep those channels uh, regulated. So once the fall uh, starts to stand after the squeeze, the maladjusted falls, we try to mimic what the mayor does. And they give a, if you watch some of these mirrors, you, you hear the incisors give them a bite right on the butt. It's kind of like the old doctor pictures where they slap the baby. They don't do that in the hospital anymore. They used to do that to, get, to wake the kid up. Well, you know, those guys are all in jail now that did that. So you can't do that anymore. But you can, I think it's still, I can suggest pinching the poles rear quarters. And then use a rope that slides easily so you keep the pressure on easily. And just remember, they're not anesthetized and they can arouse. They have blunted pain response, but they're not going to let you do everything. But on our little stimulator, yeah, they, they're, they're less, less likely to respond to the same stimulation. So those are some tips. So here's, here's how we integrated when uh, a clinician is on. Uh, did you see that level that uh, was posted right there? Let me do it. The progesterone levels greater than 1,200. It should be uh, two at 24 hours. Mm. So this was a premature placental separation. It was doing okay. Then it started fading. So we use this harness squeeze uh, in the hospital. You can integrate squeeze along with critical care. This is getting the oxygen, getting the nasogastric tube, first nursing of the mayor. This guy was squeezed every four hours. That's Dr. Alleman hanging onto the foal. Not every clinician uh, knows how to integrate that into uh, uh, the intensive care situation. Uh, I think it can easily be done, and I think there could be some, uh, certainly some advantages. And uh, uh, so if you take a look at uh, the progesterone levels, and that's a compound that, that I would suggest uh, is, go is a very uh, high, high likely to be the marker that we're looking for. The progesterone is probably measuring a whole slew of these other neurosteroids. That's okay. So this is when he arrives at the NICU and he's, uh, I don't know how, how old he was, uh, 12 hours, I think. And then the field test, there's a little progesterone field test you can do on the countertop. It's greater than five when he came in. Immediately before we got around to squeezing him, you get all the catheters and it's, it's gone up to 1,200. And then the squeeze, he, he perks up. But it does not lower his peripheral level of progesterone, but it's working on the brain. Six hours post-squeeze, then two days post-squeeze, you see it's down, and then the field test is less than one after 48 hours. So a foal that you measure this uh, progesterone this low in, they're not going to respond to the squeeze because uh, they're not affected by the neurochemistry. You've got some, some other thing going on. So this is graphed here that... This guy arrives, and look how this continues to go up. So, man, then all of a sudden we're fighting more depression, more gut motility, all those things, we think. And so we see it going down. So that's the uh, – I hope that answers that okay. It sure does. That's great. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out how to advance my slide, and I'm uh, – there we go. And this is a normal drop in progesterone in normal foals. You can see it's real high, short – this right after it comes out of the mirror – that's because it's been part of the keep you asleep system. And then it goes down to less than two at, at, uh, at uh, 24 hours. So if we want more evidence that there's some uh, effect, here's a nice study done uh, last year in lambs. Uh, that, uh, that In lambs with prolonged time to suckle and signs of neonatal maladjustment syndrome, resuscitation, compression, result in significant improvement in behavioral scores, reduced time to stand, time to search, and time to suckle. It had no side effects. So this is what they did. They did it for five minutes in the little guys there. This is at Oregon, uh, published in vet clinics. One pound of pressure, they called it. And uh, so they had some seizure activity. They looked, measured fear response, interest in suckling, attempt to, to, to uh, you know, stand and things like that. And here's their summary. 
the use of resuscitation compression. I'm surprised they didn't call it the Madigan squeeze, but I just let them. I just have to let that go. It's a highly valuable method for improving <laughs> abnormal behavior in newborns in lambs with prolonged time to suckle and or showing signs of maladjustment. It results in significant improvement in behavior scores. Uh, then the New, England, New Zealand Veterinary Journal Thoracic Squeeze, they're calling it there, uh, in, in calves littered by C-section that didn't know the udder from up or down. And then uh, on the farm, uh, folds that uh, calves that are getting the uh, esophageal feeder and whatnot, uh, getting a real uh, brisk response. And uh, these ones are, of course, they're not septic and things like that. So... I've got a slide with a case study. I, I'm going to uh, just verbally talk about it so I don't name the clinic. But uh, one one thing that's occurred in two folds is that they were in NICU for three days at this clinic. Uh, the owner uh, uh, was a thoroughbred farm manager, and the client said, forget it. Uh, we're done. We're not spending any more money. Then she asked to have the foals sent back to her with the tube in place, the IV catheter in place, says, I'm going to, I can do that stuff. And then she asked, they'd been squeezed, right? They had not been. As soon as she got them home, she squeezed them. They stood up and nursed. This was 72 hours after critical care, and she pulled all the stuff off them. So that's in two cases. So I'm sharing that because I'm, I, I'm the squeeze guy, right? So I, 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 I'm hearing all this stuff. This is not, you know, something in science direct. You got to search for. So uh, that's that's pretty much the story. Uh, and then, you know, it's it's not too much different than uh, this thing. They they say, you know, kangaroo mother car the chair started immediately after birth, and that's where they're swaddling really closely saves lives. And in Colombia, and then I'll just stop for a second. The death rate for premature infants was 70%. They were dying respiratory infections, et cetera. And those that were held close to their mothers for the large portion of the day not only survived, but thrived. So the World Health Organization is now uh, recommending this for low birth weight infants. And now they're saying we want all infants. It stabilizes heart rate, improves breathing, gain in sleep time. Uh, uh, earlier hospital discharge, improve oxygen saturation. So nobody knows the mechanism for this, but I'm going to suggest that we have a, uh, just show you our our Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant. We did a study with Stanford and skin to skin after birth and natural course of neurosteroid levels. And we showed that in kids that didn't go through the birth canal, infants, they had higher levels of progesterone in 24 hours. That's as much as we get. And now they're showing that out to age 20, uh, this was a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant, and, and out to age 20, uh, neurodevelopment is higher in kids that have significant amount of uh, kangaroo mother care. So uh, they, they've got the same thing. Uh, premature infants have higher levels of some of these neurosteroids. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're excited about that, and uh, it can be pretty pronounced. So anybody that wants to follow this f- further, just take a look at Australian premature infant brought back to life with uh, uh, kangaroo mother care, uh, would declare dead in the hospital in Sydney. And then the mother read about kangaroo mother care, said, I don't care. You said the baby's dead, puts it in her chest. An hour or two later, it starts moving. The husband's got his shirt off. They got this on a video. The kid's seven years old now, normal, and uh, in a, a remarkable, uh, really remarkable thing. So you might say, well, how does that happen? When there's significant hypoxia, the brain needs to be protected for evolutionary survival, and now pregnenolone is neuroprotective. The bad news for the prey animal, the foal, is it puts you to sleep. It doesn't you know, help you. Your brain starts to quiet down too much. And if you're an infant and you've had had hypothermia and things like that, you'll get sleepier. You know, your metabolic rate, we think, goes down and down and down to protect your brain, just like cold water. And then through this process of tactile squeezing and the kangaroo mother care, that we think that then that's the safe signal to lower the allopregnenolone and then... Uh, uh, be be with the mother where you can nurse and be protected, et cetera. So there may be some more things there. So I just, oh, last thing, how many times have I said this last thing? 
We had a uh, little thing we put on YouTube that had 10 million views. Uh, that was a, a, a record for UC Davis. And it was talking about the fact that neurosteroids have been seen in ch children with autism and were also elevated in the foals with abnormal behavior. So the, there was a study, a uh, peer-reviewed study, and it showed that the autistic child in, in, in the saliva, the DHEA sulfate is here, the normal kids are here, and here's the foal, abnormal foals here. So several of the same neurosteroids uh, uh, were involved with that. So I'm gonna, I have my last slide picture here, so uh, I'll get to that and then take any questions on there. I wanted to thank Dr. Allman and, and a whole bunch of other people that are involved with our research, but I hope that kind of tells a little bit about the squeeze and, and why we do it. Yeah, John, that's fascinating. And it's great that you gave us so much background there because it, it is something that has plagued uh, neonatal medicine and equine for a long time. And it's just great to go back to the 50s and tip of the hat to Peter Rostale for being the person that made a lot of observations of which we base a lot of our care on today. And it's just fascinating to see how people that sort of had so little to work with actually made some really good observations and some really good leaps uh, mentally to actually get us to where we are now. And uh, you were part of that. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a fun uh, thing, and it's uh, it's rare to uh, to have a procedure. I mean, you have CPR for people that have a heart attack. You have different things, but it's rare to have a procedure that you could use anywhere in the world if you have a rope, because as we know, <laughs> uh, a lot of foals don't have the benefit of getting the good care mm -hmm. like they get at Root and Riddle and UC Davis and lots of other private clinics. Uh, from cost and availability. So this procedure is on the internet of how to do it. And we hear from different places around the world that that's being a, a benefit. So that, that's really satisfying to all of us vets, you guys and everything. That's our, we put all this effort in because we want that foal walking out the door. And if we can help remotely with trying a procedure like that, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, gratifying. Yeah, and you're and you're right. You know, I mean, it, it makes a marked difference to ones. And you know, it's case selection. You're right. You know, things make sure there's no broken ribs. Make sure there's certain other things that aren't going on. But the foal is just, as you say, it's curled up like it's in utero, and it says, "Okay, well, we're just going to duplicate what you didn't get coming out the way nature designed." And all of a sudden, the foal's acting like it should. And so, it's very impressive. It's very. It was shocking, actually. Even though it uh, it appeared that I, I had some predictive comments about it. It, it, it when he nickered, I thought we're on. Mm. We, we we got something here, and uh, it's that GABA receptor closing that chloride channel. They have all these diagrams that rushes in and then closes. So the the fellow the people that we worked with with uh, doing the allopregnenolone studies, they just published one showing in kids with. Uh, a certain uh, high amount of repetitive uh, uh, activity that are autistic spectrum disorder have lower levels of allopregnenolone. Mm. So there's some some connections there, and the foal uh, hopefully will stimulate a little more research. That's a one in 150 births with autism. I'm not saying it's all involved. It's just great to keep keep looking to to, to see where we can make a difference. Yeah. yeah. And, and these maladjusted foals, treating them, it can be frustrating. So having another tool in our arsenal is is uh, appreciated. Yeah, because they, they, can, they can change fast. Yeah, and there's only so much medicine can do, you know, and this yep. is just like part of trying to duplicate the natural process. Yeah, excellent. Well, uh, John, we're uh, really, uh, re really motivated by what you've told us here. It's been a fascinating um, episode of Stallside. There's a great amount of history and uh, lots of really good information there about um, these maladjusted foals. And I think it's going to cause a lot of the people that listen to us to look at things a little bit differently. And, and as Bart was saying, it's another tool in the toolbox to get these foals up and on those mares. And, and you're right, that foal nickering to its mother, you should always talk to your mother. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's great that you're doing the podcast and <clears throat> allowing opportunities for a little, you know, personal storytelling, like how somebody gets started. Uh, I really appreciate that because I it really was uh, knowing nothing and then really seeking. Just I need help. 
<laughs> from the people that were doing it. And we all do a little bit of that, but it was uh, it was a lot. And uh, so I appreciate being able to share that the connections with Rosdale and, of course, uh, the clinics in the U.S., Florida, and then Kentucky and Cud and your place, Bill Bernard, and all the guys that uh, have been involved with this for a long time. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for joining us. It's it's uh, it's been a great show, and we appreciate you having having appreciate having you on it. Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks a lot, you too. I really uh, look forward to seeing you in person. We're uh, hopefully uh, getting out of this thing, and uh, I'll uh, hope to see you soon. Yep, that's good. That's absolutely our wish too. John, thanks again. And uh, that's uh, stall side for this week. We've been talking to Dr. John Madigan, uh, UC Davis, and he's been giving us some insight into maladjusted foals. See you next time. Mm-hmm.